Welcome back to Sociology of Global Social Problems. I am Dr. Beverly Yin Thompson. In this class, we are using a textbook called Global Problems. So in this video, we are turning to chapter two, which looks at work and trade, the global assembly line. So this chapter will be applying what we've learned in the introduction in chapter one, understanding social class in chapter one. We now turn to look at who does the labor in the world and how global regions specialize in certain types of work and of course within regions on a much smaller scale. In this chapter, the chapter learning objectives are to understand the historical and contemporary divisions of labor globally, understanding the key terms of this chapter relevant to the control of labor and production, understanding the role of labor, corporations, consumers, governments, and trade agreements that regulate the global economy and the ability to apply the sociological theorists that they introduce us to in this chapter to the contemporary issues in the global supply chain. And so overall, this chapter is examining labor within the global economy. Each chapter opens with a vignette of a particular country that can illuminate the issue that will be discussed in that particular chapter. And so this is chapter two, talking about work and trade. And so they use the country of Mauritius as the example for this chapter and state that historically this country's resources and location had been exploited by the Portuguese, Dutch, French, and British in that order. And it later in 1968 became independent. However, even though the country did become independent, the ways in which it participated in the global labor supply remain similar to those patterns that were established during these more colonial eras. And so this chapter, like the other chapters, always brings that history of colonialism and how those established patterns still resonate with the global trade and still resonate with way the ways in which global trade continues to operate in many similar ways to these historical practices. So for example, some of these countries and regions of the globe still maintain the same type of manufacturing and in this case it was textile manufacturing as it did in previous centuries and the ways in which these economies also evolve. The section also mentions how Mauritius has moved into technology, offshore banking and tourism and the ways in which these new industries support each other and still follow colonial pathways. In chapter 2 after the opening vignette about Mauritius the first content section is called the division of labor and it includes a very brief overview of four main theorists that are going to be used in this chapter. But the first section under the division of labor introduction has two paragraphs that just overview what labor is basically within human history. And so it's stating that in these more prehistory times in societies with simple economies such as hunter and gatherers that more people are going to be doing same tasks. There might be a gender division, ma male hunters, women gatherers, but the vast majority of the people of these simple societies are engaged in the same labor practices with some kind of general divisions of labor. And as society becomes more complex, then the division of labor also becomes more complex, more differentiated, more hierarchical. And so that is therefore the distinction between a simple society and a complex society. And so a complex society is associated with civilizations, with institutions, with cities, with this establishment of these structures. And that comes after what the last chapter defined as the Neolithic revolution evolution or the move into agriculture and the ability to stockpile food and other resources basically. And so the four theorists that they outline in this chapter are Adam Smith, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, and Karl Marx. Two of those we've already been introduced to in the first chapter, so that's helpful. And this will just reinforce what their theories are about, but also introduce another key element of their theories that apply to labor in particular. And so the first one that they talk about is Adam Smith and his focus for this chapter is on efficiency. The author states that Adam Smith believed that the great efficiency of modern capitalist economies, even as they existed in his day, lay in their complex division of labor. 
However, Smith did provide cautions and understood that if the capitalists colluded and got together, that they would want to push this to the extreme, push up their efficiency and also squeeze out the most work at the cheapest cost out of their labor supply. The next theorist that they summarize into a two paragraph nutshell is Emil Durkheim under the key term solidarity. So Emile Durkheim is a French sociologist and considered the founder of sociology. And he focused his theory on the division of labor in overall society. As the author summarizes, he believes that simple agricultural societies had strong common bonds, what he called solidarity, and that this particular solidarity re related to these simple agricultural societies. The solidarity was natural, even mechanical, as people came together without thinking about it. So Durkheim referred to this as mechanical solidarity. So mechanical solidarity is a key term and that is related to these simpler agricultural societies where it's just more natural, mechanical. In contrast to this, Durkheim's concept of organic solidarity was applied to these more complex models of labor division. And this was called organic solidarity because people would be bound together because they needed each other within these complex divisions of labor in which each person contributes a very small part of the overall general society output. The next theorist that the chapter mentions is Max Weber, and he was born in 1864 through 1920. And in the book that this chapter focuses on is his book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And within this book, he combines religious devotion to that of one's secular vocation and saying that one should dedicate as much to the job that they do as much as they do to their religious practice. The author points out that his Protestant work ethic was to be applied to the capitalist owners of the means of production, but that it has often commonly been attributed to the workers, that the workers should have this kind of dedication especially. The fourth theorist that the author brings back into this chapter is Karl Marx focusing on the key concept of alienation. Karl Marx was providing the worker's perspective to this concept of a very specialized workforce saying that, for example, if someone is able to create a product from, be from beginning to end on their own, then they have this great craft and skill. They can create this entire product on their own. They're very independent. When workers are reduced to a cog in the wheel, they only provide this very simple and singular task. This small task doesn't lead to their independence because it's just this one part of the larger whole. And so this aspect of the division of labor then can lead to the alienation of the workers within this type of very hierarchical specializations. He's also saying though that unlike farmers or agrarian workers who are very distributed throughout the land, that the industrial workers are standing shoulder to shoulder within these factories doing their minutia labor task and therefore just their proximity to each other provides them an opportunity to talk to each other, to organize amongst themselves and to work together as a collective. Especially if you have a factory with hundreds of workers there, then if those workers came together, they could really be a force to be reckoned with countering the owners of the, the factory. And so the key concept for Karl Marx is alienation. So in the next section called the New International Division of Labor, the author is therefore taking these four theorists and applying them to some key issues within the contemporary global labor force. And so the trend globally is for the labor force to become more and more complex and more specialized. So therefore certain regions of the world might become specialized in a particular aspect of the economy, but also within countries, of course, there are geographic areas with particular specializations. So in the historical colonial era times, the old international division of labor was a division between producing raw materials and producing finished goods. So the author 
rights in European colonial systems, the home country's city produced finished goods from the materials from which were produced by the farms, forests, and mines of its colonies. So therefore, historically in the colonial area, you have this division where the colonies provided the raw resources and therefore the industrialized countries produced the products and were paid a high wage for that. And this was the process through the colonial era and up until World War II, basically. And after World War II, we see the process of deindustrialization. And so these industrialized nations now begin to send their factories to other countries and reduce their production industry. So the industrial countries deindustrialize and therefore transition into this category that he terms post-industrial. So these jobs then go to these so-called developing countries and within those countries they might even go to an export processing zone which is another key term in the chapter in which a particular zone even though it's within the national borders of a country is excluded from their laws and excluded from tariffs and treaties and such as that and treated as a zone in which it's going to have a different policy applied to it because it's going to be classified as something other than the the country that it's within and so in some ways these historic colonial pathways of the global economy continue to persist. But of course, there's new developments, especially job growth lies in computers, law, banking, accounting, and related fields. But at the same time, it grows in service tasks, cleaning and maintaining offices, serving fast food, care work and hospitals, and so on. And these types of divisions exist within nations, but also spanning across nations. And we see a shift from the regions of sending countries that send workers and receiving countries and how they might specialize in particular industries. The chapter also includes the important aspect of how some companies and multinational corporations are becoming so large that they equal the size of some countries. And so he has the statistic on page 60 that of the world's 100 largest economic entities in 2017, 69 were corporations and 31 were countries. And so we live in a world in which corporations are larger than countries. Some countries are very small some are very large so just the power dynamics that that will therefore embody and in the final part of this section he has two more key terms that we should be able to distinguish offshoring and outsourcing and so offshoring is when you move the entire factory from one country to another from US to Mexico however the difference with outsourcing is to take a particular task. It might be just one element within a particular industry and to move that to other international areas. So you don't move the entire company to this new location, but just one aspect of the task that relates to the final product. And so a telephone company might outsource its customer service to India, but the entire industry did not move to India, which would be outsourcing of the industry. The next section in the chapter is called The Boundless Frontier from East India to Amazon. This overviews how the contemporary labor market is divided very roughly. The first sentence in the section states, the push for cheap products and high profits has long driven industry to try to combine first world technology with third world labor. In some of these sections, they contrast our contemporary labor practices to those of 100 years ago when we were importing into the United States a lot of immigrants who would do this type of labor. And so now instead of having immigrants or low wage workers within our country doing this labor, it's exported around the globe in search of the cheapest labor possible. So certain industries or tasks or products might shift and change diff to different countries on this constant quest for cheaper and cheaper labor sources. And so this section does state 
The frontier of industry has been on the move for over 400 years, incorporating slaves, immigrants, migrants, and displaced farmers, among others, in the search for low-cost labor. When textile mills grew in England in the 1700s, small farmers were driven off their land to make room for more wool-bearing sheep. The farmers, men and women, were then unattached labor who could be employed at low wages in the mill production. The resulting products were shipped literally around the world. And during the colonial era, of course, there were these large-scale companies and the, the textbook mentions the Dutch East India Company, which may have been the first publicly traded holding company, a conglomerate of rivals founded in 1602 with big ships and big financiers. So incorporating this colonial history of these trade routes that were established and that was talked about in the previous chapters, these trade routes get even more embedded as these capitalists seek shorter routes to ship their products than they have even created canals such as the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal. So the Suez Canal was carved in the 1860s and then United States engineers began the challenge of creating the Panama Canal in the early 1900s. And so imagine these canals in the time periods that they were being built and now how large our shipping containers have grown. And of course we saw the story in 2001 when a large shipping container was stuck in the Suez Canal in 2021 and that caused incredible cost in global delays. So imagine the contrast of like hundreds of years ago, the United States imported slaves in order to do agricultural work, all kinds of labor. And this labor was location-based. It was developing our country, building the railroads, picking cotton, working on agricultural farms, construction of buildings, houses, institutions, cities, and so on. But now instead, the owners of production can send the raw export material out to any country in the globe in search of the cheapest labor possible. And instead of kidnapping and stealing people and shipping them to the United States where many of them died in the passage, you would have that labor conducted not within the national boundaries of our country, not within the sight of our citizens and the consumers who end up buying those products. You would ship the raw material to these countries in which it's their own governments that are establishing the rules for how labor rights will be constructed. So you can have governments of countries that are abusing their own people. And of course that could be completely hidden from view of what people can see globally. So the labor situation can actually be quite insidious because we can ship raw materials to a particular country. That particular country establishes the rules for labor and human rights. They establish the rules for who can enter the country, such as journalists, such as outside industry observers who can see the conditions of how people are working. And so these things can be quite hidden from us and then these final products are just shipped onward or even just pieces of products. This chapter is also talking about production chains and we really want to think about that. Like every single item that we own, every piece of clothing that we're wearing, every technological gadget that we have in our hand, every drink, everything that we consume comes from somewhere probably outside of our country, the components. And so we really want to look at and understand how every single one of our products comes into our lives and all the hands and all the labor that were involved in that process. And so for this chapter, I would invite my students to really apply the theories of this chapter to a particular product or industry that is relevant to what they engage with on their daily life. That we're engaged in this process. Everything we consume, we provide the market and the consumer for that product. And so that encourages the owners of the means of the production to find the cheapest labor, the cheapest sources, and to make the highest profits off of that. And so our power as consumers is that we're buying those products. We could buy different products. We could not consume those products, or we can at least be aware of what we are consuming and where it comes from and who's involved in that process.
The next section is called Occasional Help Wanted. This section talks about the different government programs that establish temporary worker programs. And so within the United States, it states during World War II, where labor was scarce in the United States, the US government began the Braceros program from the Spanish word arm. A bracero is a strong manual laborer. The program was so successful that it extended until 1964. So the United States and Mexico have always had these labor policies in which they would bring laborers from Mexico to the United States for a short period of time in order to provide labor for a specific agricultural crop in a timely manner and then not to allow those workers to establish roots in this country, but that it is temporary, they have a temporary visa, and that they have to return to their country. This is a way for the United States and the receiving countries to set the parameters of how this how these workers can enter the country and that they must leave. And this has always been the situation like with the Chinese building the railroads, those were temporary workers, not allow these workers to really establish roots, to have families, to have children. And of course, Chinese laborers back in the 1800s were not allowed to marry white women. And so they were not allowed to really get established. And so this is the challenge for the receiving countries and the capitalists is that they want the labor but they want to be in complete control of this labor and make it disposable. You know, at the end of the job, they can send them back. Companies in the United States who might use labor that is undocumented, say, it's the worker that gets in trouble when those things are discovered and not so much the company. And so the punishment should go towards the company and they could be fined, they could be put out of business if they're employing labor that is unauthorized. But instead it's the worker that suffers the biggest punishment. Therefore the government sets up the situation in which it benefits the company to report themselves so that they, the workers are then arrested and deported without their last paycheck instead of the company owner going to prison for this violation. And so this section just overviews some of the different programs like there was Braceros program which was one of the first Later on in the 1950s, the government began the program they called Operation Wetback using this racial slur in the title of the program. It, and the author states, this derogatory term for illegal laborers became the title of a massive program that existed between 1954 to 1958. Mexicans working illegally and many legal workers as well were rounded up and returned to Mexico. So this was a program established because citizens, it's now the 1950s, so it's post-war time and Americans were afraid of outsiders taking their jobs. And so this program was established in order to deport these workers. In 1964, this Operation Wetback was replaced by the Border Industrialization Program, BIP. This program allowed materials to be shipped across the Mexican border to neighboring cities assembled by low wage labor there and then returned to the United States without export duties or tariffs. And so the Maquila Dora was born, a plant whose only purpose was as an assembly turnaround point for industrial goods, particularly textiles and electronics. And this goes on through the 60s and especially gains force in the 1990s when we have NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was ratified, which extends the special trade privileges of the Mexican border cities to all parts of North America. And you see that unlike Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand of the market, tariffs are created in order to control trade across borders. And then to counteract that, you have these regional trade agreements such as NAFTA, which undermine these tariffs, which are trying to protect the resources and labor of a particular country. And so we've never had an, a, a free market. We've never had a market that is not inhibited by all of these trade agreements. So in 1993, with the rise of the NAFTA North American Free Trade Agreement, we had the social movement in Mexico with the Zapatistas that really pushed back against NAFTA. You had presidential candidate Ross Perot, independent, who uh, famously said, 
you're gonna hear a large sucking sound as all the jobs in the United States are sucked down to Mexico seeking out this cheap labor source. And then this section also states that in 2020, United States, Mexico, and Canada agreement called USMCA was touted as a major fix to the problems of NAFTA, but only added a few new restrictions and updates, essentially becoming NAFTA 2.0. So the issue is when we think about American jobs or how the labor industry is operating globally, it's the companies and the governments that are facilitating this and the policy makers that are creating these trade agreements, that are creating these regional trade agreements that facilitate the entire structure. And these things control every aspect of the, the economy. And so instead of blaming these migrant laborers who are seeking out any work that they can possibly find. It's really this entire system that's seeking out the cheapest labor form possible in the globe. If you think about how every job could potentially be outsourced in the future so that you have American workers competing with workers around the globe, then it's going to be a, this serious race to the bottom where people are basically going to become enslaved again. And so you can see, as the theorists pointed out, that the trajectory of capitalism and the desires that motivate them, just the way in which it operates, it's it's going to push workers into slavery. And so that's why it's so important for workers to really push back against that because who else will do that? The next section in the chapter is called Working the Line, Life on La Frontera. And so we see that the north border in Mexico was created into this industrial production zone, which has special territorial exclusions that make it different than the rest of Mexico. NAFTA overruled that so that all of Mexico was now in this processing zone. And the section says that as the fastest growing part of Mexico, this border area is the most prosperous but the least appealing because it's basically where people, where Mexicans, where laborers can go to get these horrifying jobs basically in which they are really enslaved. The border between Mexico and the United States creates this twin city dynamic, which is established in order to facilitate the movement of products into and out of the United States and Mexico, raw materials, final products. And this section quotes a worker talking about how horrible the labor conditions are in this area and just the small acts of resistance that the workers engage in. They're saying that the power imbalance between these non-unionized workers and the sheer magnitude of these corporate entities that move into these areas. One corporation can basically determine the labor market and the future of an entire community. A company might go in and employ thousands of people so they can really dictate to the local government conditions. They can get the local government to give them benefits for moving to that area. Perhaps the company contributes to the area by building some ro roads that of course the company is gonna use. And in, in exchange for that, they can get the government to really provide them a labor source that is cheap and compliant. The next section is called Push to the Wall, Walmart and the Big Boxes. And so this section basically points out how commerce and consumerism had been conducted. Compare it in contrast to 100 years ago when we have Main Street, we have the rise of the department stores, move to the suburbs, they move to the malls during this 1960s time of white flight when white residents and companies move out of the inner core of the cities to the suburbs. Of course, these small main street stores were mom and pop stores, they were locally owned, they were small local community stores. With the shift to the mall and to these larger conglomerates and mega businesses, then you have these more international stores that are not locally owned have now become even larger and larger into what we call the big box stores, mega stores, which is represented in the, as the chapter uses the example of Walmart. And so we can think of Walmart and what it did to these local mom and pop shops, right? Walmart comes into a small community, say they have a hundred small little locally owned shops that support the city. Walmart moves in, this one big box store can replace all of these 100 small locally owned stores. All of those people go out of business. They all start to work for Walmart. 
Walmart now controls this town and so can set the wage level, can set the conditions of labor. And the entire point of Walmart is to provide the cheapest consumer products possible. And so how do you do that except finding the cheapest raw materials, the cheapest labor sources, and to be the biggest store on earth, basically. And so the chapter mentioned it is the world's single largest market of consumer items, Walmart, and it employs 2.3 million people globally. So Walmart Walmart is, and like the previous sections have mentioned, some of these companies are indeed as big as countries. And just the point of the big box store and understanding this section is just the sheer scale of these corporations and this industry and how that has changed. And just imagine the contrast to 100 years ago when we have these small locally owned stores. So what does that mean for the economy when you move from a model of small locally owned stores to these huge huge transnational conglomerations and corporations that are as large as a particular country. And now of course Walmart, the Walmart model has shifted to Amazon model of an online model of consumerism. You don't have to go to the mall, you don't have to go to Walmart, but indeed you just order it online. The next section is called Made by Small Hands, which discusses child labor. And so of course child labor is something that's been in effect since labor has been in effect. And indeed, it was a big part of the early labor movement in the 1800s and the 1900s in the United States, the involvement of children in labor. And it's only because of the labor movement that we think that child labor is a bad thing in our current era. But at the same time, child labor right now is rampant around the globe. And so this section starts out with U.S. labor history and talking about one of the most remarkable marches in Kensington near Philadelphia, a march that took place from Kensington in Philadelphia towards Long Island. And it was made up of hundreds of children, many of them missing fingers and others disabled from accidents in the textile mills. And they were marching under the leadership of Mother Jones, a grandmother and organizer from West Virginia. The children focused on a single demand. They wanted their 60 hour work week shortened to 55 hours so they could attend five hours of school a week. And the chapter has images of historic children working in these textile factories and then contemporary images of children working in contemporary Nepal and Bangladesh constructing bricks. When we think about the logic of capitalism and the owners of production seeking out the cheapest labor sources possible, of course children would factor in. Children are a cheap source of labor and children some of these industries really appreciated the small size of children. They could go into small holes. And so this section also talks about just the different industries in which children were employed. So they were employed in textiles and their small nimble hands were used to create and sew clothing, manufacture clothing. And they were also used in the mills and in the mines. Children were small so they could send them down in a bucket into the mine and do this very dirty uh, mining work because of their small size. And so in the 1800s in Great Britain and New England, children were used up to 60 hours a week as a very cheap labor source. The last short section in the child labor section is called Hooked by the World Economy. And so we might think that child labor has disappeared because we don't see it visually in the United States. However, it's just moved globally to places we don't see. But child labor is still, in fact, involved in constructing the products that we use in our everyday lives. And so the chapter quotes the International Labor Organization, and this is good for us to note, like this is the place where we could find details and statistics on international labor data. According to the International Labor Organization, the ILO, there are 152 million children working worldwide. And here they break down the sectors in which children work in and the numbers attached to that. And also later on, they mention the geography. So we wanna just make a note of that for our understanding.
So it says a large majority of these children, 71% of the children work in agriculture, 12% work in manufacturing, 17% work in services. And the ILO states that 73 million children are working in what they defined as hazardous jobs. So these are all numbers that we should have memorized. The author states that 10 million children are in chronic labor bondage in India alone, and that more than 1 million children work squatting before dusty looms in Pakistan carpet factories. And they mention children work in factories in Honduras, Brazil, China, Thailand, Indonesia, and the author states, yet it is in South Asia where the extremes of poverty combined with a history of child labor to produce some of the greatest abuses. And of course, reformers are trying to challenge this situation now as they did 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The next section is called a trade free for all. They cite the theorist David Ricardo and his concept of comparative advantage. So the author states, Ricardo believed that national specialization coupled with vigorous trade was the receipt for world prosperity. Each area of the world should do what it does best, where it has a comparative advantage over others. And so of course we can make sense of this with the geography and the landscape in producing particular crops. Certain food crops are better suited to certain regions of the world. One of the disadvantages that the author mentions, of course, is that small countries might specialize in two or three items, and those items may go out of favor in the global market. And so therefore, those small countries that depend on a particular product are then going to be adversely affected. However, more darkly, the author states, what if the comparative advantage of a nation is in providing a cheap, docile labor force that won't demand higher wages or better conditions? What if the advantage lies in lax environmental laws, insufficient labor protections, and many desperate people looking for work? This is the darker side to comparative advantage. And so this is especially useful for us to understand is yes, comparative advantage. And if the capitalists and those who own the means of production go around the globe seeking what's best for them and how they can exploit labor the most, then they're gonna find it in this globe of such extreme inequalities of how people are living. The next section is called Chain of Production Around the World, and it focuses on four particular industries and their production chain. And so this is a great topic for especially my students who are thinking about the discussion board to talk about a particular industry or product and its global production chain. So the first industry that this section looks at is that of toys. The author states that toys are cheap and easy to ship but intensive on labor. And so therefore, this particular industry has proliferated in China. So there's lots of factories in China that are producing toys and then they're shipped out into the globe. The second industry that this section focuses on is that of electronics. And I found it interesting because the author was saying that Silicon Valley started out using immigrant and Asian American labor to manufacture microchips in California during the 1990s. And yet with the increase of neoliberal policies in the 1990s, this particular industry was outsourced to Asia and now the United States is not able to produce its own microchips and it's you know a huge issue for uh, the leaders that be because now Taiwan proliferates globally in the production of microchips and that concerns the United States because they're worried about its proximity and potential control by the Chinese government and so it was just interesting to see that this industry was already here and it had it stayed here in Silicon Valley and developed into a, a microchip industry within the United States. Then we'd already have that advantage right now. The next industry that the section focuses on is that of textile industry. And it talks about how the textile industry was originally established in the United States in the mid 1800s. And of course in Europe, and that this industry really relied on young immigrant women laborers. And now these types of products are being shipped around the world. And they're not even necessarily produced 
in a particular region, but even each component might be produced in different areas. But the chapter mentioned a documentary called A Coat of Many Countries, and so I have a link to that in the website. So that might be interesting to check out as far as just how this industry, each piece of the final product is produced in a different region of the globe and all comes together. So if you think about, you know, 200 years ago, if one person made a suit, the skill that that person would have, the amount of time that that would take. And so of course, yes, it's more efficient, this process right now, but maybe not if you look at what economists call externalities and which to me is sociology. You know, externalities are not things that you can just ignore, but it's the actual cost of the, the production of this product. And so if now you have to have 15 different laborers around the world that live in six different countries work on a final product, and if that has to ship around the world X number of times, the fuel that it costs to get that product around the world, is that more effective and efficient than one person having that kind of skill set and being able to take the time to produce it completely and have that connection, of course, like from the worker's perspective with the final product. Whereas, you know, the 15 people that worked on these little pieces of the final product never see the final product and certainly have no connection to the final product. So it's just interesting in this section when they compare how these products were made 200 years ago to what is happening now in this global industry. And so the next industry that they focus on is food. And of course, everything we eat, we go to the grocery store at any time of the year and we find all the fruits and vegetables from anywhere on the planet at any season. So then just how fragile this product is, you know, it's very time sensitive, it has a very short shelf life. So the next section in the chapter is called ordering the world market. And so that is how these international economic processes are governed at the international level. This section now turns to focus on these global institutions that regulate trade. And so the first one that they look at is the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. So for my students thinking about the discussion board post, this is also a great area to write on. We want to really understand what is the IMF, what is the World Bank, what are these large global trade policies, and especially the details inside of them and how that can affect our daily lives or how this shows up in the world. Because these are such huge abstract things, we don't even think about how they have a particular outcome in the world that could be critiqued from a social justice perspective. And so the International Monetary Fund was created after World War II. Western powers came together and were concerned about the future economic globe and how they would wrest control of that, really. This resulted in the leaders of the capitalist world having a meeting at a resort called Brenton Woods in New Hampshire to discuss the future of the world global economy. And this later was referred to as the Brenton Woods Agreement. And so the author states that the International Monetary Fund was created to regulate the world's currencies. Its original tasks were to avoid runaway inflation, prevent collapsing currencies, and facilitate trade by establishing exchange rates between currencies. One tool the IMF had at its disposal was lending money to prop up struggling economies. And so this is really interesting to me, be particular, because about 20 years ago, there was a lot of protests that became the subject of my dissertation and these were protests against the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and this was to protest this kind of growing neoliberal trend that we saw with the creation of NAFTA and NAFTA was the impetus for this social movement and this perspective within the academic world too on this new role of globalization. We think of institutions as, as these benign entities that oh, it's a bank, it's just lending money or, or whatever, investing money. But what is it really doing philosophically and what impact is it having on the globe? How is it structuring the globe? And so here, for example, the author states, uh, the philosophy of the IMF from the beginning has been deeply rooted in neoclassical economics. 
reduce government and encourage free markets and free trade as the route to economic stability and prosperity. So that's the key sentence is that that is the orientation of the IMF. This policy and perspective is going to therefore shape all of the activities in which it engages in and it's they're all going to result in that kind of outcome. And what does that mean for people, for the environment, for us as consumers, and so on. And so there's a lot of critique against these global institutions. And so for some of the critique against the IMF is that this is an institution that is promoting neo-colonialism, basically. It's still controlled by US and European powers and interests. It was dominated originally by Great Britain in the United States and continues to be dominated by the United States. And so politically it is, for example, the section concludes by saying, by agreement, the president of the IMF has always been European, while the head of the World Bank has always been an American appointed by the US president. So just imagine that within the context of global power. So that obviously shows that Europe and the US control these institutions and then the outcomes is that money is lent to countries that don't have the power to push back against the, these countries and this institution. What happens then is that the IMF goes and loans money to countries that need to borrow money, which obviously means that they're in a desperate situation. And the bank says, yes, we will give you this loan, but on these conditions. And so those are called structural adjustment conditions. And there's especially four primary structural adjustment conditions that the IMF requires of countries when they accept these loans. And of course, they're accepting a loan that they're going to have to pay interest on. So they're already losing a ton of money. And then you add these kinds of adjustments that the country has to implement to its own internal domestic policy. So you see that then the US government and European powers have control over the IMF. And then the IMF through a loan gets to have absolute power over the countries in which it loans money to because obviously they are in a very weak position and not in a position to negotiate back. First of all, they want to reduce government spending, so slash social programs. These are programs where the government spends money to provide some service or resource to the people. And not only to slash these programs, but to privatize them. So now that they're they're slashed, they're cut, they're handed off to a private company, and now this private company comes in to provide the service, which you have to think about quality control, and of course they're gonna charge money for this service. So previously the people got this service for free before, now they have to pay for it. Another structural adjustment requirement from the IMF is for governments to devalue their currency so that their products are cheaper abroad. And so part of what the IMF does is regulate the world's currencies globally. And so in this way, the IMF gets power to specifically tell and really pressure a country to de devalue its currency which of course hurts the country and most especially hurts the people inside that country and benefits these rich nations and these rich financial institutions. And then another structural adjustment that's required is to create more industries that are export oriented. Say that a country was producing some kind of domestic crop that fed its local people. Now the government is going to be pressured to reduce those kinds of industries and support industries of manufacturing toys for export. And so this might directly be taking food out of the local citizens' mouths because domestic industries that were serving the domestic population are devalued and now the the country the economy is pressured to be more oriented to an export market so that's by definition creating products for other countries and so you can see that when leaders and it's the top leaders that take out these imf loans and so therefore they have a lot of power in potential corruption of them and their cronies taking some of these monies and using it for their own personal gain. But it's the people that really suffer the consequences and it's the local domestic economy and the infrastructure of the local 
country that really suffers and it's all to extract wealth from the country for the benefit of the banks, the IMF, for the United States and for these developed market countries. So that's the IMF. That would be a great topic for a student to work on for their discussion board, especially focusing on a particular country and its terms with the IMF. Along with the IMF, this section has a subsection called the World Bank, and so the World Bank also came out of this Brenton Woods meeting. The World Bank also targeted low-income and middle-income countries in order to provide loans to, and of course these loans came with high interest rates that the countries find difficult to repay, and so some countries might start with World Bank loans and then subsequently turn to the IMF for relief from these loans resulting in those structural adjustments. The next subsection is called from GATT to the WTO. During this post-World War II time period in which what was what came to be known as the Washington Consensus arose at this Bretton Woods conference in addition to other meetings of global leaders who came to agree that these tariffs should be reduced and that the world should move into one that reduces barriers to trade and they call that free trade. So this is also called the Washington Consensus, this neoclassical economic perspective that promotes free trade. And so during this time period, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, GATT, is established in 1947. And that is this organization that attempts to manage this vacuum as countries reduce their own national tariffs. In 1994, GATT was replaced by the World Trade Organization. And so this is a global organization then that is now tasked with taking over, overseeing these agreements of trade. And it does have tremendous power to enforce its policies. So the powerful countries also have power over the World Trade Organization. This includes the US and China. And notably, the WTO does fight against countries' abilities to reject product based on safety concerns, labor concerns, environmental concerns. And so later on, the chapter concludes by saying this is a direction in which the World Trade Organization and other trade organizations could shift to one including more of a human rights perspective, but that's not the trend that we see. So the WTO does enforce cheap production costs in business, reduction of barriers to business at all costs, and those costs include costs to human labor and to the environment. The next subsection is called Other International Trade Groups. This includes APEC, Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Conference, a meeting of 21 of the world's leaders to promote trade and economic growth within the Pacific Rim. It mentions the World Economic Forum, which is an annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland, amongst the most powerful of corporate leaders and political leaders. I like that these sections also include that there are a lot of protests at these meetings and that means that the people, the civil society is also organizing to address these issues and to really counteract that these are the world's most powerful elite leaders and here they are behind security making decisions that impact the entire globe and every person and animal and environment on the globe and yet the people do not have a seat at the table. And so the people have also created organizations in which to be a place for the people's voices to be heard, for the environmental issues to be heard. And so that includes the World Social Forum that was established in Porto Alegre, Brazil. There was one held in the United States, the US Social Forum in Atlanta in 2007. I was there, I got to take some video. I have some videos that I filmed on location at US Social Forum. And then it also mentions the group of seven, G7, and the G20. And it's interesting to note, obviously, that the rise of BRICS has come after this book has been published, and so that wasn't included in this chapter, but it's definitely something I encourage students to look at. This would be a great topic for a discussion board post. 
And BRICS is really interesting to think about as well because it is providing a counterbalance to the Western powers and indeed a response to the Western power hegemony within these global trade. And so BRICS is an intergovernmental organization and it's comprised of the United Arab Emirates, Ethiopia, Egypt, Iran, South Africa, China, India, Russia, and Brazil. The concluding section is called Trade That Is Fair For All and in this conclusion, the author is trying to put forth the hope that workers' rights, that human rights, that environmental concerns can also be issues on the table at these large international gathering of world leaders and as well as these policies. The author stating that nearly all countries in the globe have been pulled into this global economy either by choice or by force. A lot of these forms promote continued global inequality just based on the inequality of the countries who are involved and the powers that they wield within these institutions, within these policies. And so I'm glad to see that this chapter did mention the counter protesters, the World Social Forum, and this has been a fantastic place for activists the world over, indigenous leaders, environmental activists to come together and to really present what is happening on the other side of these global agreements, what the people are doing around the world to promote more equality, to protect the environment, and to prote protect their rights. And this issue is really important to me. I personally wrote about this for my dissertation, which was published in 2007, and I focused on what was called then the anti-globalization movement, the global justice movement, and the protests that you may or may not have heard of that erupted at the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle and all of these subsequent meetings and the FTAA meeting that took place in Miami that had a lot of police violence towards protesters. But the reasons in which there are protests are because people are trying to bring attention to human rights, workers' rights, and environmental concerns of these global policies that the people have no impact in the creation of, yet the, it's the people and the poorest of the people that suffer the impacts of these structural adjustment policies that come at the hands of the IMF, the World Bank. So it's really important for us and I would encourage students to really look into also the people's movements that have pushed back against these trade agreements and what the people are doing on the grassroots level to protect rights, but also to create an alternative economy that's not dependent on fossil fuels and that does promote more equality in these processes. So that would be a great topic for students to also focus on for their writing projects. Whether you're a student in this class or not, I really appreciate your attention and I'm really glad to see that people are becoming public sociologists, that they are concerned about these global political systems and how they impact real people. And I would love to hear about what people are concerned about or involved with concerning the global structuring of labor and global trade. So I look forward to your comments and I'll see you in the next chapter, which is on the topic of gender and family, overburdened women and displaced men.